It's working. All right. Hi. How are you guys doing? I was say, I'd go with the, is this thing on, but I'm already scared by my own voice, so I'll skip it. Um, so the title of the talk is kind of like uh, Adding Smarts to Your Code, A Dirty Introduction to Data Mining. And I'm going to apologize in advance to any people who actually are statisticians or math people in the audience, because we're going to lie a lot throughout this presentation. <laughs> yeah, three types of, like, what was it, lies, damn lies, and statistics. So, um, you know, standard thing uh, brought to you by the nice people who actually pay my bills and my rent. Um, engine yard, I work for them. So as a wage slave, I actually have to mention them because they, otherwise they get really angry when they pay for my plane tickets. Um, and the obligatory thank you slide, which is first, because I'm actually going to take you guys back to probably all those horrible courses in things like applied statistics, mathematics, linear algebra that most of us, I don't know if you're like me, you twitched through sometimes more than once. So anyway, um, thanks for, uh, for, for actually like, you know, listening to this stuff. So where are we going with this, right? Data mining. Actually, how many people here have heard of data mining? Oh, wow, even better. How many people here are actually actively using data mining or analytics for a daily project or some part of their job? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, that's kind of what we expect, right? It, unless you're actually like trying to profile people to make sure they're not getting onto a plane, not a lot of people are doing it. So, if you're all familiar with it, then we know kind of where we're going. There are any number of techniques which all sort of account are sort of are applied as data mining. Everything from neural networks, applied statistics, any number of things, right? So, really, I guess the whole point is when you get down to it, data mining is all about taking all this stuff and turning it into information. We've got lots of data, but we don't actually have a lot of information, and it's one of those things which is pretty rare, right? Um, so, who's really interested in this stuff, right? Amazon. Anybody? actually ever have like a wish list on Amazon? Has anybody's wish list ever gotten shorter? <laughs> so there was a disturbing thing after I got a Kindle. I realized that my wish list is the same as credit card debt. It is directly convertible one to one for credit card debt because what ends up happening is like I buy one thing off my Amazon list, it suggests six more and I add three of those six to the list. So I'm screwed. There's no way I'm ever actually going to get everything off that list and it's like it might as well just be pure credit card debt. So the way they do that is by using collaborative filtering, right? They actually do a data mining task on the back end that's basically sitting there churning through all the things that I might want to read, listen to, or purchase, and then they're shoving it down my throat, and I'm really too weak to stop them. So, you know, I, I think a lot of us are in this boat. Um, other people who are actually doing this. Uh, anybody ever hear of these guys? Anybody here have a 360 or a PS3? Okay. Yeah, PS3, 360. Anybody here actually turn on streaming for Netflix? I used to send one movie back about every four months. I was the ultimate Netflix customer, right? I never rotated my movies. I was actually too lazy to take the prepaid envelope and put a DVD in it. That's pretty freaking lazy, right? Once they had lost on streaming, I don't know what happened to my life. Like, it literally, I'm sitting there, it's like, hey, you're like Lost, you're like Lost. I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll try it out. And it gave me, like, this predicted four-star thing, and I'm like, eh, eh, eh. Yeah, okay. So after I basically apologized to all my friends for blowing them off for about three weeks, they knew, right? How did they do it? They actually sit around all day, and they run lots of data mining tasks that actually compare me and all the movies I like against everybody else. It's the same way that you know you can actually segment things from, from Buffy to, I don't know, Firefly to Conan the Barbarian, right? They have a huge data mining task that's actually going back there. And if you remember, not too long ago, there was something called the Netflix Prize, where there was a lot of money attached to somebody actually improving the data mining accuracy of how they make recommendations. So if you think about it, if somebody came along and could recommend movies better than Netflix, Netflix could go out of business. And in fact, if you the only thing you can think about is the fact that Blockbuster thought that Netflix was never going to go anywhere. So there's definitely something to be said for turning all that data into information. So the 10,000 pound gorilla in the room for, for data mining has got to be these guys, right? Make no mistake, Google is a data mining and analytics company. They are basically the number one company in search because they can go through 12 billion documents in a split second and give you the five that you were looking for. Does anybody here actually, how many people here actually give directions anymore? I don't. I just, I Google it, you know. I send people a Google map, and I, it's really weird. I actually forgot one of my friends. She refuses to get a smartphone, 
and I just told her where we were going, and then there were all these angry texts later, like, hello, what's the address? And I'm like, the, the address? I, and in fact, the worst part about it was, then I realized I didn't know. I followed my Google Maps to get there from somebody else's tweet, right? So, if you, they keep, in, yeah, I know, it's sad, it's pretty meta, but when you get down to it, right, they're giving you two or three gigs of storage for your email, they're converting all your phone calls into text, what are they doing with it? They're actually mining it to figure out everything about you, right? What you're going to buy, what you're going to search for, what you're looking for. Eventually, somebody's going to walk up to you and they're going to be like, hi, Google suggested me as your new friend. And they're probably going to be right, which is the really scary part about it. So, and eventually, you know, this is what we want, right? Eventually, you're going to get to the point where you just walk around and everything's going to be data. You're going to walk into a car dealership and you're going to know that that same Toyota is actually on sale across town. You know, you're going to be able to, you start seeing these things already with like the iPhone app that actually does the Yelp overlay with virtual reality. You know, this place sucks for beer. This place is good. It's like, I don't know, sometimes when you're walking through Chinatown, you really need to have this information because you don't know what you're going to be getting off of the, uh, the buffet line. So... The question comes down to, if it's so cool, how come everybody isn't doing it, right? If it's so powerful and all these great companies are doing it, how come we all aren't doing it? How come out of everybody here who's heard of data mining, no real hands went up when they said, are you using it on a daily task? Well, um, it's difficult, right? But make no mistake, the future is about information and not data. And understanding how to convert between those two is really the key to being highly paid and keeping a job. I would actually sort of predicate or sort of put out there that if you aren't closer to converting data into information as you move forward, you're probably slowly but surely moving to the back of the food chain and what we do as a job, right? Automation is about collecting all this information, storing all these things, but ultimately what are you going to do with these things? Um, you have to turn that stuff into information. It's no good for me to tell you the exact number of stocks that are being traded on the NASDAQ 500. It is good to tell me, for me to tell you which stocks are actually going to go up 5,000% tomorrow, right? And that's the difference between data and information. So we're about to basically start the lies. This is going to be the world's shortest statistics course because you can't actually start talking about data analytics or data mining without a fundamental understanding of statistics, which you're not going to get here. But I am going to try and give you in one slide. This is it. Everybody, how many people here actually took statistics? Like, how many wanted to? Okay, we've got two. How many were forced? So I was in the force category, right? And part of it was I really think that it, it was one of those things where they abuse engineers and they're just always like, oh, hey, you have to take this econ and stats crap. And nobody ever told you what it was for. But really, statistics is about distributions in some sense, right? It's about this curve, the normal curve or whatever. We've all seen this before, right? Has anybody never seen a normal curve? Has anybody never actually gotten a B in a class because of this? I mean, it was, I argued my way to a B by curving, so hey. Um, Anyway, what we're really looking about when we start talking about statistics is from some sort of curve or distribution, figuring out and using it to actually help us guess something else, right? If I tell you the average height of everybody in this room, what we're really saying is that 5'8 or 5'9 is right about here, and somebody is actually probably somewhere within a couple inches of that, right? That's what that distribution is telling us. And that's really what we're trying to do with statistics. All the fancy stuff that we really start talking about when we start doing these things are really still about developing or identifying a distribution, right? Um, two types of statistics. Descriptive. You know, um, descriptive statistics are exactly what you would think. You were describing somebody. And bonus geek points to anybody who gets the quote underneath. No? Oh, man. Uh, wait, wait, who said it? Ah, yes, Blade Runner. As I'd say, and the next one gives it away, right? Um, then the second type of statistics, inferential, right? Inferential is where we often think about statistics. Statistics are inferential. Statistics are things like, you know, which one of these horses is going to be coming in first tomorrow, given what I already know about it? You know, at the average age of a winner is X. The average length time of a, of a horse running is, is Y. Given these things, can I guess what the odds of this horse winning tomorrow's race are? And this is where things start getting, um, they start getting sticky, right? It's the same thing. Amazon wants to know which book I'm going to buy. What are these books that actually I'm going to be interested in? What movies do I really want to see? These are the, this is the inferential part. This is actually how you start making suggestions, right? So continuing the, um, the crash course on this stuff and basically diving, really diving into lies, there are two tasks basically that you always want to do. First one's called classification. Classification is exactly what you would think. It is, what is this that I'm looking at? 
Is it orange? Is it round? Okay, it's probably a basketball, right? Is it small? Is it white? Is it a baseball? Is it a tennis ball? You know, is it a cricket ball? You never know. So classification is one of those things that we do all the time, right? Breaking things into taxonomies and breaking things into groups. As it turns out, teaching a computer to do this is non-trivial and very difficult, especially because getting the classification wrong can have dire circumstances. Consider, is this a terrorist or not a terrorist, right? You know, either way, if you get it wrong, if you actually aren't on the watch list and somebody says that you are, or if you are on the watch list and you get on the plane, there's an issue at hand, right? But a lot of times what they're looking at when they start doing things like for the TSA is they're actually looking at statistical data mining methods, where you flew, where you came from, how long you've actually been flying, where's your visa, blah, blah, blah. They add these things all up and it gets like a credit score, right? Or not. Or, or, yeah, exactly, or not. And I wouldn't necessarily trust those guys to add, but hey. Um, second thing that we're interested in, right? Prediction. Given like this classification that I just did and actually this taxonomy I just built, what can it tell me? What can I predict from it, right? This is a stock game, right? Uh, the P-E ratio, you get all these pundits on like, you know, headline news or the guy who screams all the time talking about stocks with the horns. What's he doing? He's predicting what's going to happen next. And a lot of times, especially when we start talking about like web properties or web applications, this is what we're really talking about. I'm trying to con like convince you to buy something. I'm trying to convince you to interact with my process or my game. So I'm going to predict what's going to happen next, right? Um, so most often than not, for most data mining tasks, what you're really doing is a mixture of both. You're doing some sort of classification or segmentation on what you already have for information, then you're trying to predict what's going to happen next. So this is basically, by classification and prediction, this is exactly how almost all these systems work. If you think about it, Netflix identifies and classifies me as a person who likes gory horror movies and bad fantasy, right? It then predicts that I'm actually really going to dig Conan and Red Sonia. Yeah, I'm not afraid to admit it. So, um, two types of, basically, ways that we can apply this. First one's called supervised learning. Anybody here have kids? So, anybody here have toddlers or nieces, nephews, four range? How many people here would let a group of six to eight, four to six-year-olds play unsupervised? <laughs> DFS wants to talk to you, right? Um, you know, leaving toddlers alone is a really bad idea. Chaos can ensue in minutes. So supervised learning is, is really comes down to one thing. And I've removed all the math, nasty math that actually puts the connect, connections on those arrows. What it really comes down to is that we have some observations that are inputs, and we have some observations that are outputs. And what makes it supervised is that we tell the system whether it's right or wrong. You know, it, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. Is it a duck? Yes. Great. It, quacks, it walks, it's got feathers. Is it a duck? No, that's a goose. Oh, got it. So this is a duck, that's a goose. That's the definition of a supervised learning problem, right? So anybody want to guess what the other type of learning problem is called? Right, unsupervised. This is like Catholic school, right? What we're talking about here is that there is absolutely everything going on and you don't necessarily know exactly what's going to happen. But there is a really great diagram that describes it. So, at some point, you guys should be looking at me like I'm crazy. I just lied to you, right? It's the same picture. It's the same picture as it was for supervised learning. I just changed observations to this weird thing called latent variables, right? It's like, what's going on here? This is a bait and switch. As it turns out, mathematicians hate saying that they don't know anything. So, instead of saying, um, this is a big fat stack of I don't know at the top here, they call them latent variables. And the concept here is that latent variables are things that I might not be able to really directly measure the effects of. So things like, you know what, well, the weather. Maybe it kind of all did. Well, I don't know. Maybe it was temperature. Maybe it was moisture. Maybe it was all these atmospheric effects that I have no, absolutely no data for. But I assume somehow they contribute to the observations and that it all evens out in the end. That should be kind of scary to most people. So how about this? Would you like me to actually teach a plane to fly you to your next destination using supervised or unsupervised learning? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, so this is kind of a scary concept because what I'm telling you here is by changing that one thing from observations to outputs is that in an unsupervised learning problem, I don't necessarily know what those inputs are, but I, once I get some measurements at the other side, I'll be able to tell you. Yeah, really creepy. So... Um, so that, that's kind of breaking it into two taxonomies. There are a lot more things that we actually can do and apply techniques for machine learning, but those are kind of the two general cases. 
So, as always with these sorts of things, the devil's in the details. But the first place that you should always start when you start data mining or looking at data mining and, and mining your data is sim simple statistics. These are probably stats that you've all heard of. Mean, average, we all know about these things, right? Arithmetics. Well, it turns out um, descriptive statistics actually has something called the five nums. And the five nums tell you almost everything you really need to know about a standard data set. And those five nums are minimum, first quartile, mean, um, median, third quartile, and max, right? So what that's telling you is essentially a whole picture of everything from the minimum value, the maximum value, and then what, what's kind of in the middle, right? And it's, it's one of the things that we're always used to saying, on average, such and such will happen. You know, on average, 90% of people are not going to default on their home loans, right? Things of that nature. So this is what we're talking about. Um, so if you want to actually do something like this and you want to do it in Ruby, there are two really great things for it, Ministat and RubyStats. Um, I like Ruby stats because it's actually a one Ruby, like it's literally like a one page file all written in Ruby that allows you to use it in arrays and actually do to calculate some basic stuff like averages, means, and modes. It's really useful, especially when you just have like an array of data and you actually want to get those five numbers out of it. Um, I'm actually also going to show you a picture of the greatest data mining tool ever, spreadsheet. Cut and paste some stuff and data in your spreadsheet when you actually want to start mining the stuff. Run some average functions on it and be done with it. It's really super easy to get started doing it, and it's actually a great way to check things. So, you know, pull up Numeric, pull up Excel, look at it. Um, when that's not going to work, what you really do is you start breaking out the industrial tools. Has anybody ever heard of R? Ah, actually, we have some people who have heard of R. So R was actually based on this, SPSS, and it's basically a statistical in computing environment which really doesn't do it justice. It's kind of like saying C is a powerful programming language, right? Or, um, I don't know, OCaml is functional. It really just kind of, you know, you're just really understating how powerful it is. Um, so all the examples I'm going to run through, I'm going to show you are actually in R. And the reason being is that there's a really great way to cheat. There's a, a Ruby to R bridge that allows you to actually take your experimental code that you'd run in a shell like IRB with your R code and then dump it right into your Ruby. So, you know, cheat, get lazy, right? Write it once and then have somebody else take care of shelling it and connecting it to you. So. One of the things we're going to do is just to kind of give you an idea of like what we're looking at with five num stuff. Um, sorry if it's a little difficult to see. Uh, but this is actually a data set that comes with R. It's called the Forbes 2000. It's from, I think, 2000 into the top 2000 companies. Basically based on sales, profits, assets, uh, a couple other things. So one of the things you can actually look at here is just from five nums, right? Let's look at profits. I think these are in hundreds of millions of dollars or something like that. The minimum is minus 25.8. The maximum is 20.9, and the stuff in the middle, the median and the mean, is 0.3. Like 20.9 by 0.3 between the person who made the most money in the Fortune 2000 and the person who is in the middle. What does that tell you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You want to be one of the outliers, right? I think this year it was Citigroup. So... And then you look at the minimum, it's negative 25. So whoever like, is in ranked 2,000 at the bottom was losing like, I don't know, like 250 million or $2.5 billion, something like that. That's crazy dispersion on that spread, right? So there are all sorts of, even just by graphing these things, you can actually take a look and be like, whoa, the person on the tail end losing money is literally a factor of 100 behind the person in the middle, how much they lost, while the person ahead is a factor of 100 ahead of them. That's a big, pretty big gap, right? And then you can look at assets. Uh, the, so the minimum is 0.2, the median, the, the mean is 34, um, but the max is 1,264. It's good to be Citigroup, right? They've got a lot of money. They've got a lot of assets. They've got a lot of money. They're making like fat cash, and then they've got a lot in the bank. So just by looking at like the five num summary of something like a, a set, if I were to actually give you these profits and give you a list of 2,000 values, who could tell what they meant, right? But by just doing a quick summary and breaking it down into five numbers, you get a picture of exactly where the middle of, this, of these values are and where the outliers are. So to bring this back into perspective, what if you started doing this on the people who are buying things from your website? You know, are your prices too high, too low? Are they across the board? What are people really spending? You can actually start looking at all these numbers and taking a look at it, and it really can matter. And 
Conveniently, here's the Ruby code to do this. So once you actually install RS Ruby, which is the Ruby Java bridge, you just literally avow the exact same R code that you would have run inside the environment. And you know, it's not particularly uh, sexy in regards to how, actually how much code you need to put up. It's just a bridge. So the same stuff you do experimentally in R, you can easily get access to in Ruby. So to give you a, a, another idea of what we're looking at, we can actually take that same five number summary and we can actually do a box plot and generate these box plots in R. So has anybody ever seen a box plot? Does anybody actually remember how to read one? Because I forget every single time I look at one. So, which is why I put all these labels on here because I wasn't going to remember for you. So what a box plot tells you is essentially take that five number summary that we were just talking about and gives you a, a vertical, sort of a picture. What you're really saying is that like 96% or something like, something like 96 or 99.6% of all the values lie in this area. And there's still three outliers up there, right? Those are the guys who are making massive amounts of cash. And then it tells you where most of the values lie plus where the, me the median is. So one of the things that you can actually do to correct for this data is because it's so spread and it's so dispersed is we actually also did a box plot of the logarithm of the exact same data. So these are for the top 50 companies. And so you'll notice that once you put the log on there, it actually sort of squishes it down. And you don't have so many outliers. Um, the whole point of this is that simple statistics can really help you paint a picture for a large swath of data. It's really easy to do, and it's something that anytime you're actually looking at either internal data or external data, you might consider doing. And it's, it's, it's ridiculously easy. There's almost no reason not to do it. And it's the great first place to start when you look at data mining. So, but one of the things that we're most interested in, right, is everybody wants to write the next great prediction engine. If you can, you know, Netflix is going to give you 10 million bucks, right? So predicting is actually, you know, more art than science in a lot of ways. Um, because it basically requires you to build a model around the interactions of the people who are actually looking at your data. You have to know something about what you're trying to predict. But the basic principles are still the same. Even though if you go look and read the literature, it's almost always written for somebody who has a PhD or a postdoc in, in mathematics. So it gets really ugly. So what we're going to do is we're going to take another step, we're going to lie to you about it, and we're going to tell you what the basics are. And this is pretty much how almost every single prediction engine works. We start with something called a feature vector. So what does one mean if we're talking computer terms, generally speaking? Yeah, and zero means what? False, right? So given this, what can we say about person zero? Right. They don't like hard liquor. Right? They, they like beer. They like wine. Whiskey, gin, not so much. You can also say that person zero is not me. Um, so let's take a look at the person one. Yeah. Exactly. They're the exact opposite, right? So when we have strings of bits and we're computer people, what do we do? Well, there are only so many things you can do with a series of bits. Come on, we have a couple operations, bit shifting, anding, oring. Well, let's say we want to predict this person here. What might we do in order to figure out whether or not how like person zero is like person one? I mean, intuitively, we can see that these two people are completely on opposite sides of the fence, right? One's a hard liquor drinker, and the other one's a beer and wine drinker. Uh, exactly, and in some. So, bitwise and. So if what we did is like intuitively we can take a look at a vector that describes a person, one person he, zero here, person one here, we can sort of intuitively see that they're not the same. And if we and those two feature vectors together, we get zero, right? So if we wanted to do something like compare these two people, how alike are they? Well, they aren't alike at all. Relatively trivial example if we're talking beer and whiskey, but what if you're doing a dating site, right? Imagine you have a feature vector which is a thousand miles wide and it's like, you know, likes long walks on the beach, dogs, blah, 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 foo, foo, foo. Doing this is a really simple way of actually figuring out who I'm going to go on a date with next, right? You want the people who actually have the most bits in common. So at every level, a collaborative filter performs something akin to this at its very basic level. The, the vectors might be encoded differently. The operation might be much more mathematical and much more advanced. You know, you'll, we'll get to one in a second that actually starts talking about hyperplanes and multiple dimensional spaces and all that crap. But what, really what you're doing at the end is you're putting together a feature vector, encoding it, and then anding them together to figure out how close they are. 
So what else might we want to do? We've already done like comparisons, right? This is like clustering. This is ex essentially what every single clustering algorithm does. So the next thing we want to do is we want to do a prediction, right? We want to predict whether or not I'm going to like somebody. Well, predictions, just the exact other operation we started talking about, a vector sum. You know, if we imagine we flip one bit on person zero where they like beer, wine, not whiskey, but gin, it's also not me because I'd have four bits across the board. Um, you can imagine that if we and these or sum these all together in a column and I'm trying to predict what somebody else is going to like, it's pretty easy for me to sit there and say, well, most people like beer, most people like wine, most people like whiskey, but everybody likes gin, right? So imagine now I have a column where I have, instead of two people here, I've got 10,000 or 100,000, and I actually am summing things up. I could get a pretty good bit vector, even if I actually rank them by, you know, what has at least 10,000 votes, what has at least 5,000 votes, and I could make pretty good collaborative suggestions on how that would actually work. This is the basics behind collaborative filtering and prediction, right? Amazon looks at what I've purchased, compares it to everybody else who's purchased something with similar purchase history, adds it up, and then comes up with what I'm missing in that column. And it says, well, I think Randall's going to buy X. So at its basic point, this is what uh, all these systems do, right? So, ta-da! Here's some of the most um, underwhelming code in Ruby ever, right? This is actually the code that's required to do bitwise and feature vectors. This is a data miner. It's really simple, right? It's almost trivial. And the other, the other operation we'd have to define is bitwise sum. Also really trivial. Um, actually, I can't because it's like I cut it out of my uh, syntax highlighted text mate and like dragged and dropped it. I got sick of actually cutting and pasting RTF. So, um, I don't, I'm not sure if it actually works in presentation mode. But let's see. Yeah, I, w I will do that for you guys. So, um, and you know, it, this is a, basically showing exactly what we were talking about, right? Um, you could imagine that in any set of feature vectors, if you were going to do this to make predictions or collaborative suggestions, that's all you'd have to do. Now, obviously, the mathematics behind it gets like super hyper advanced. There are lots of people who have done lots of study in this. To get better suggestions, things that are basically not error prone, you can't just add a column of bits. But the key point of doing this is that remember, ultimately, no matter how crazy or odd that the next step you're going to see is, what we're really doing is taking something across an encoding and then adding it together or taking a difference. And those basically essentially represent some sort of clustering in our prediction. So, um, Clustering. Well, let's say we uh, speaking of clustering. How about cluster? Oh wait. So now you get the preview for the rest of the slides, right? Da -da -da. Clustering. Where we were. Clustering always does this, right? Everybody remember the distance formula from analytic geometry? Square root of x squared plus y squared, distance between things. So every time that you're basically clustering or making suggestions about how like people are, that's what you're doing. You're defining some sort of distance metric between two groups. That's it. In a plane with x and y, it's really easy to use that Euclidean distance, right? But you could very easily use drinker, non-drinker, right? You could use binaries. You could use likes dogs, hates dogs. Likes cats, hates cats. But the whole point of clustering is really just to get some sort of distance metric and then assign people to one of those groups by using that distance metric. That's all it does. And it gets really complicated sometimes, but still at its very fundamental core, that's it. So one of the most standard types that you'll see every place is something called simple geometric clustering. It's called KD means clustering. And it's exactly what you would think. It is somebody taking a Euclidean distance of some real valued variable, square rooting it, and then saying, okay, these two points are this far away, and then putting together with some sort of, call it a radius or epsilon, right? So what we did here is we actually took a look at how many clusters would it take to accurately put the 2,000 companies based on profits 
into groups and what would it mean. So you can see if we look over on the left, right, that if we use one cluster, obviously all 2,000 companies are going to be in exactly the same cluster. It's not really useful. However, if we notice this long tail over here, once we get over to 14, you know, 13, 12, 10 clusters, it's really not all that useful. So what we're really just trying to sit there and, sit there and show is that when you start putting people into groups or clustering, you're actually in control of the data. This is actually one of those places where you get lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? Um, I could very easily bias what you're going to think about the profits of these 2,000 companies by selecting a certain number of clusters, right? And grouping them together and then making sort of general gross generalizations about those clusters. The other thing for you is when you start looking at using clustering or applying it to your, your sorts of situations, remember you might be putting people into either too many bins or not enough, right? I might be putting dog lovers and dog haters in the exact same bin and that might be a bad thing, right? Or I might be giving everybody their own bin, in which case, you know it, I don't know, Shih Tzus and Pit Bulls and blah, blah, blah. And so the next thing you know, the only thing that ever happens is that Pit Bull owners are only talking to other Pit Bull owners. So just think about that when you actually start putting together clustering, uh, clustering scenarios. Um, once again, this little R code that actually goes through and given some, some data, will actually create clusters for it. And we picked five as an arbitrary list of clusters. And so what it does, it basically clustered them by profits. And the interesting thing here is that it actually picks these numbers. Five is neither good nor bad for this example, and I'll show you why. Um, 1.3, 4.8, two of them are profitable, three of them aren't. One of them is marginally unprofitable, one of them is wildly unprofitable at negative 11, and one of them's like, you know, I don't know, their controller just might be taking a vacation. So just by doing that clustering analysis on the data, what we've shown is that not only are the profits from that five numbers summary really widely dispersed, but also there really just aren't that many, like, you know, the profit centers themselves, most of them are probably going to tend towards being unprofitable. So we could check that with something like called a histogram, right? Just to validate this assumption, as it turns out, what we did is we mapped who was into each one of those clusters, and if you look back, it just basically assigns the cluster number. Cluster three is mildly unprofitable at like negative 0.09. That's actually the largest grouping that we have. Profitable companies are the smallest. And this is the 2000. I'd say, you wonder where your tax dollars are going, right? Um, so once again, just by using a, a, some simple data mining that we've actually taken a look at this, we've actually shown and discovered some things about the data. Now, the caveat with this is remember, lies, damn lies, and statistics. We're making some really gross oversimplifications about the model and some other things. Looking at the dispersion of the data, we would have been much better off probably doing the logarithm of, of this information and actually doing the log of the profit so that it would compress things and that it, we wouldn't have so many outliers and wouldn't be so tightly grouped, right? But that's, you know, that's, that's kind of like one of those things where I said we're glossing over a lot of the details. Well, um, this is basically another example where we did a fit with 10 clusters. It didn't really marginally change things all that much. Most of it was still there. So, the one we really wanted to get to was not simple non-geometric clustering. So, this is actually where we basically take the ideas that we just talked about, some simple bit stuff and some simple ideas of what are things alike and what are things not alike, and then apply it to this really crazy, weird Doctor Who style multi-space geometry. You don't really have to know how it works, just kind of that it does because we're going to give you the glossy overview that basically sits there and says, if you go off and apply this to most of your problems, you're going to be able to get a solution that works, right? So, non-trivial question, and this is going to be like a brain teaser, right? We've got a line. We've got some squares on one side and some circles on the other. Who here can draw one line vertical that can divide these into a group? Okay, everybody should be raising your hand right about now. If you're breathing, right, you should be able to do this. Right? We put a line in the middle right about there. It'll divide this evenly, right? We'll have the squares on one side and the circles on the other. It's like shirts and skins. Pretty much, yes? We all agree? I'm not tricking you yet? Because I'm going to start lying to you in a second, and you're all going to start screaming, so pay attention. So what happens, though, if we move one of those circles over? Who here can draw one line that can actually separate these two things? Yeah, it becomes very difficult, right? So you now, you, now you have said saying, aha, that's actually a very good point. It's like, straight line? Uh, yeah, you could consider that maybe you could get like a curve that kind of goes up here and around there and then over here, right? I 
that's an interesting concept. So the gentleman just said, what about a line that goes this way, saying horizontally? Well, as it turns out, that's exactly what you would do. Because with mathematics, we can basically, when we like paint ourselves into a corner, we don't lie, we transform, right? We, we project into a different space. So instead of actually sitting there saying, no, I can't draw a vertical line, which is true, you can't, well, what if I just projected those red dots into a different plane and then basically drew a line between those two planes? So once again, remember, this is, there are all sorts of lies and assumptions that I'm telling you here, but essentially, at a very base point, this is exactly what you do when you actually use something called a support vector machine. So there's this one scene in a movie like where Samuel L. Jackson said, when an AK-47, when you absolutely ha positively have to kill every single motherfucker in the room, support vector machine is kind of like the heavy lifting of machine learning problems, just because you can generally pretty much throw it at a lot of different classifications of problems, whether it be real valued, labels, text, whatever, and it just kind of works. There's a whole bunch of evil mathematics about why it just kind of works, but the, what you guys need to know is pretty much almost everything you can throw at a support vector machine, it'll be able to classify a segment. What we were basically trying to show you with that line problem is that when you have two classifications that are easily separable, it's trivial, right? Left, right. But when all of a sudden you do something like a very small tweak, just something like moving one dot out of the wrong place, and they're no longer separable, and there's no longer a trivial solution to creating a cluster or creating a classification. You know, imagine if on that line what we had actually plotted was likely to blow up a plane and unlikely to blow up a plane. You know, the guy who's getting stuck in security is the person who's somewhere in between. So it, it's definitely a non-trivial solution. So a, what a support vector machine does is um, it basically makes use of something called a maximally, maximally marginal hyperplane to otherwise efficiently divide a space in, yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's pretty much what happened for me for every the first time I read it, and it still happens to me when I read the literature on it, and a lot of times it bends my brain. So what we're really saying about what a, this picture says is that if I've got two groups of things, whether they're in a plane or not, I'm going to basically be able to draw the most efficient line possible that maximizes this separation between the two groups. And so what we're really saying is that what a support vector machine does is it just breaks things into groups very efficiently. And the nice part about it is, is that A, it'll operate on data in any dimension, pretty much, and once again, simplifying lies, and B, it'll actually be able to operate recursively. So I could actually then go off and apply another cutting plane to break these into groups that, you know, above some sort of value and below some sort of value. And then you can use that to create decision trees. You can use it to create basically groups of things. And you can just hurl it at data, and it'll kind of figure it out. So to draw it back to our earlier analogy of what a feature vector is and what prediction is, what the only thing that's different is that once we actually had person 0, person 1, we were making our recommendation about what person 2 is going to like or person question mark is going to like, instead of using a distance metric that was plus or minus, like a bit, we now actually have something called kernel. And that's the support vector transformation. That's the kernel, something called a kernel trick. And so what all kernel does is it says, hey, here's a space over here. Here's how you get these dots in this space and these dots in that space. Right? And so that's exactly what a support vector machine does. Anybody remember seeing this thing? The magnitude of a vector, twitching about it, because you, you had to be able to derive it or do something else with that? That's essentially what a, a vector product space does, is it calculates this distance in a projection in a space. So... Well, yeah, yeah, it's all kind of strange English and Greek to me. So let's actually take a look at it, right? What this does is this actually takes and generates an entire list of numbers, about 120 of them, of random volumes. But what it's really doing is it's actually it's something with a standard distribution. So what I just did here, all this big fancy stuff, is I created two groups of things. That's it. But you would never know it by looking at these numbers, would you, right? Imagine if you're looking through the log files or if you're trying to figure out if something's fraudulent. It's really difficult to know. So instead, let's plot a picture. That's a plot of the exact same data, right? So can we all kind of agree that we can see two rough groupings of things? Right? Labeled A and B, very Perry Mason-like. So a little bit of R code. This is actually the magic jiggery-pokery. Ha-ha, ha-ha. We wave some hands, and bam. This is what a support vector machine does. 
it figured out this surface plot of exactly how those things are grouped and way more efficiently than we possibly could by trying to draw circles around this stuff. So think about this. Where would you put the line? Maybe somewhere around here, kind of, right? We'd probably, maybe we could draw, you know, you said draw a curve. Well, maybe we might draw a curve that kind of went like this. Well, it did it for us. And so it's really trivial to see how this works in two dimensions when you have x and y, right? So what if we have three dimensions, or four, or five, or 500, right? What if each one of those dimensions is what you're actually willing to spend, what you bought, where your house is, what your job is, you know, all these number of variables. So calculating and figuring out what that optimal plane or surface looks like becomes very difficult very quickly, and people can't do it. And so this will work for things like spam filters. It'll work for things like collaborative filtering. It'll work for things, for instance, everything that you might actually want to hurl at it. It's pretty good. And you can read the literature to find out where it is. So we, a lot of things we didn't cover. Um, you know, I already told you I made some really gross oversimplifying things, simplifications about things. There are certainly things that you'd have to know before you actually went off and applied it on a daily basis. But the nice part about it is, is that there are tools out there that can actually help you basically get started with it. Um, introductory Statistics with R, buy this book. This is the book I wish I had when I was an undergrad in stats. I actually might have liked it, and I probably wouldn't have had to actually fight for a B. Um, it's a great book. It basically it's tutorial style. It basically takes you through the an understanding of basic statistics. After you do that, um, there's something called a handbook of statistical analysis using R. If you actually install R, this entire book is actually already installed with the computer, right, with the program. And if you type this little command here in R, it'll basically give you the PDF of the books on various topics, including things like cluster analysis, data analysis, where they, to get the data sets. And it can actually walk you through doing some basic data mining tasks. Um, when you actually really want to know how a support vector machine works, and you want to basically see the, like, you know, the, the Hawking-esque sort of mathematics behind it, you can get this book, Elements of Statistical Learning. It's actually available as a PDF. It's a really great book. The pictures alone are worth it just to actually show you what's really going on on a data mining task. Because as it turns out, all of them do the exact same thing. They just do it in different ways, and they're actually resistant to different types of errors. So uh, Simple Stats and Ruby, both of these modules are really great for actually doing the standard five nums if you actually just need a quick and dirty way to do it in IRB or with an existing project. Uh, my cheating tool is RS Ruby because essentially I just install this and I use that to do all my Ruby calculations and Ruby code um, for my statistical code. Uh, LibSVM, the R code that I just showed you actually makes use of LibSVM. So if you need to actually call out and do a calculation, it's really trivial to set up a kernel and do almost the exact same thing. There literally is, you know, train and predict. The code that actually shows you how to train a support vector machine is so unsexy, it's, it's ridiculous. It's two lines. So there's really not a lot there. But once you know actually how it works, it's actually kind of cool and pretty useful. Um, and so now here's the like the, the three second commercial. Um, we actually have Engineard, right? We actually have a cloud product. So if you actually want to deploy stuff in Ruby, we actually have this nice little lovely one click deploy thing. And we also have uh, things like snapshotting. So if you need Ruby hosting, you can always come talk to us. And you guys actually have this code will give you like $25 in cloud credit. So you can use it for free. And the best part about this stuff that I like is we buy beer. So I believe we're going to, was it Rock Bottom after this? Rock Bottom Brewery after this? And because they uh, sent me out here, I begged them for beer tab, so they actually gave me some money to spend on beer. And if you guys don't help me drink it, then my sponsor is going to be very angry with you. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Uh, by all means, email me, and I will post some of the stuff. Have any questions, because I know there are probably lots of weird things like, what on earth is a hyperdimensional cutting plane? But anyway, so we can talk about it over a beer. Thank you for your attention. So were there any, like, were there any obvious questions? I mean, I know everybody wants to get out of here. I'd love to get out of here and actually like, grab a beer, but Um, I just had a real quick question about you were mentioning five the five numbers, but yeah. it looked like there were like six on there. You had like max, min, median, I, mean. Okay, so mean and mean and uh, median are actually kind of considered one. 
The difference between one is like an arithmetic mean, um, and then the other one is just the middle value from the data set. And so what you're, and most data sets, those things are kind of close together. So they're kind of considered the same thing, but they're really not. So that's where that five numbers thing comes from. It depends on knowing what your data set is, um, whether or not you consider the mean or the arithmetic mean or the, the median, the real value that you're looking for. Sure. If, anyone, if anyone's looking for a book on this stuff to actually tell you how to do it in the real world, you might look at Programming Collective Intelligence. Yeah. Uh, Riley. So, so, yeah, the program Collective Intelligence is really good. There's also one called the Data Mining Book. It's called From the Weka Toolkit. Um, we've actually collected a whole bunch of resources on this. I'll post them up someplace if people are really interested. The Weka Book is probably one of the best because it takes a very programmer-centric. It has the libraries and it has an interactive learning environment so you can see it, exactly what it's doing to the data. And data mining is really as much of an art as it is a science because you really have to know kind of what it's doing and get a feel for what it's actually transform how it's transforming your data and how it's giving you these results. But the Collective Intelligence Book is really good. There's another one, uh, Intelligent Algorithms of the Web, that's put out by the, uh, the MEEP. So I think it's currently in MEEP, like the in action folks. They actually have that one out, so that's not bad either. So, great. So let's go, like, have, oh, yes. Yeah, I was looking recently into uh, doing something with a suggestion engine or a, or uh, some collaborative filtering. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend is good software? Is there any good software out there? I think I looked and it seemed like there's only two, um, I think they were not even open source projects that were like, or I couldn't tell if they're open source or, or what they were, but um, would you recommend anything for that? Is there anything in the box or is it kind of you build your own? Yeah, you, it's, it's actually once you, you build your own. Um, the, it's once you understand what you're doing with collaborative filtering. So collaborative filtering, a lot of times, they use something actually called singular, it's basically singular value decomposition, right? Because um, the short version of it, and I'll actually I'll be happy to talk to you about it over at Guinness, is that what collaborative filtering really comes down to is plugging and missing values in that matrix, right? The difference between having a completely known data set of, I know you like whiskey, I know you like gin, I know you don't like beer, I know you don't like wine, is that ultimately I have lots more things on there, like fruit or something, right? And you've never, I know nothing about whether or not you've ever bought fruit. So there's an empty value there. But I know other people who actually have a certain profile that's close to yours have brought fruit. And so how you get those matrices and how you basically smash them together, that's how you get collaborative filtering. And it's once you understand actually how, how it's done, I'm just going to say it's trivial, but it's relatively easy to do. And there's some, there's some actual open source tools that you can, uh, that'll help you do it. Um, so I will be happy to talk to you about that after, afterwards. So, anything else? Great, thank you.